The new RTX 4080 Super has landed, and with a $200 price reduction over the original 4080 and promises of a bit more performance, could this be the new go-to 4K GPU for under $1,000? In this video, I'll be finding out by building the best RTX 4080 Super gaming PC build to see just how this card stacks up and evaluate which parts are best paired up with NVIDIA's latest high-end GPU. Let's do this. The Asus ROG Swift PG49WCD is an insane 49-inch super ultra-wide panel that packs a punch. With a vibrant QD OLED display, 0.03 millisecond response time and 144Hz refresh rate, this thing is crazy. The 1000 nits peak brightness, backed up with a custom heatsink design and improved airflow, keeps the panel bright and prevents burn-in. While a built-in KVM and 90 watts of USB-C power delivery makes this a great monitor for a multitude of applications. Learn more at the first links in the description below. The RTX 4080 Super is the final of the three Super GPUs to release, following their announcement at CES earlier this year. The Super lineup is a mid-life refresh that aims to make the existing 40 series cards more attractive. We've seen this with the 4070 Super, where we saw a really quite significant uplift in performance, with the 4070 Ti Super, where we saw 4 gigs more VRAM, and now the 4080 Super, which should deliver a slight performance bump, but more crucially, a massive reduction to its price in. The $999 price tag puts it more in line with an AMD 7900 XTX, though the AMD card is still notably a bit cheaper, while also giving you a small bump in core counts and clock speeds that should deliver that bit more performance at 4K. We're not expecting anything 4090 wise, NVIDIA have not replaced or supered that GPU for want of a better expression, but what this card should do is make the 4080 a much more attractive proposition. Many people will say that this is the price the original 4080 should have been. I guess NVIDIA will argue differently as it's a card that sold pretty well. But times are changing and GPU prices are falling at a faster rate than I've really ever seen. You keep the same Ada Lovelace architecture as what we saw with the original 4080. The VRAM remains the same at 16 gigs. That is eight gigs less than the 7900 XTX from AMD, this card's closest rival. Though VRAM bottlenecks are not a huge thing right now at 16 gigs, but that's not to say they won't become that in the future. This palette card is a slight overclock design that sits marginally above the MSRP price point and I like the design. I think it looks really really quite nice. Backplate with silver and black while the rest of the card is again silver and black with some RGB accents for good measure. With the power consumption being where it is, cooling for 40 series is not a massive problem and I'm glad that cards like this aren't ludicrously large because put simply there is no need. Now to test this card out we obviously need to pick a spree of good components to pair it up with and while I've not done this build on the cheap I also don't want to spend huge amounts of money for the sake of it and I think that's most evident when we look at the CPU and motherboard combo that I'll be pairing up our 4080 Super with. The processor first of all, AMD's Ryzen 7 7800X3D. Now if you're building a system like this for gaming and gaming only, this is an absolutely superb choice. If you do want to do some video editing, rendering, streaming, notch up to a higher end Ryzen 9 or i9 processor. For gaming though, as I say, the 7800X3D is going to be absolutely spot on. We get 8 cores and 16 threads, which is more than enough for even the latest AAA titles. Clock speeds are pretty unparalleled allowed and the major major thing with this CPU is the amount of L3 cache you get. For reference you get 96 megs of L3 cache on this CPU, 33 megs on Intel's 14700K, perhaps this chip's closest rival. You can also find it for under $400 which is really quite amazing and I'll leave latest pricing and availability for everything down in the description below. As far as motherboard goes I've actually gone for a B650 design in this build. This is the Asus Tough Gaming B650M Plus. Now you might be wondering why I've gone B650 and to be honest with you the reason's quite simple. The RTX 4080 doesn't need PCI Gen 5 so no need to splash out the extra for that on our PCI slot and although your overclocking headroom on this chipset won't be quite as expansive as on X670 you can't really overclock the 7800X3D anyway. There's kind of no need to spend the extra cash. I also wanted to make Micro ATX because of the case choice which I'll come on to later one of the most hotly anticipated chassis I saw at CES so this is going to do the job no problems at all. CPU obviously in 
pistols nice and easily. It really is amazing how much the platform costs for AM5 have come down. I remember when these chips first launched, the boards were just so expensive, and I wondered if they'd ever come down in price, and thankfully, they have. Memory-wise, I've got a kit of this Tough RAM from Thermal Tape, one of my favorite looking, more premium design of memory. But to be honest with you, any DDR5 kit with a decent speed and low latency is gonna be totally fine. Ryzen does like a low latency kit of memory, so make sure you go for something that isn't too high. You want sort of CL30, CL32, avoid any CL40 kits or above, most definitely. 32 gigs for this build is gonna be totally fine, but it's nice to have the upgrade paths open for 64 gigs if we want it later on. Storage-wise, I've got something actually quite exciting for this build. This is the brand new Corsair MP600 Elite. Now this one comes with a heatsink, but you can save yourself some money and buy it without a heatsink as well if you wish. And this has got read speeds of up to seven gigs with writes of up to six and a half. It's basically saturating most of the Gen 4 NVMe bus, and it's of course not gonna bottleneck the graphics card. 40 series cards I got so fast, especially 4080, 80 Super, 90, that fast storage is important to make sure your system can read all those game files with enough time. I'll be installing it into the top M.2 slot, and because there's a heatsink built in already, I can save that away in my motherboard box, as I won't be needing it for the one that's built in on this drive. With the motherboard all sorted, the next thing to do is go ahead and get the case. And this thing's really cool. It's kind of like a time capsule, is sort of the best way I can describe it. And I saw a few people cover it at CES, and I was like, yeah, that's really kind of awesome. It uses up to micro ATX motherboards, but you can install mini ITX designs in here too. But what's most impressive is the GPU and radiator support. With the graphics card going on the left and the radiator going on the right of the case, you can actually support easily 360s, but up to 420mm all-in-ones and super long GPUs like this palette card right here. Now, best thing to do with any case is just to sort of take the whole thing apart. So top panel comes off without too much bother. And then I believe with the glass panel, it should just be a case of pushing it in. That's not too difficult either. And then the rest of the case is basically magnetic. So it should just be a case of pulling these side panels off. How easy is that? I really like these side glass panels as well. So the whole thing's not too square. I think that's one thing that really appeals to me about this case. And as I say, the whole thing is very, very easy to take apart. Often one of the biggest challenges with a case like this is cooling. But if we use our large radiator as intake, the graphics card can pull from this mesh panel. And then at the top of the case, there are actually two 140s pre-installed that come included. That should help give us plenty of active exhaust for good measure. Like in pretty much all of my builds, I am gonna lay the case down flat in order to install the motherboard. By the looks of things, all the standoffs are in the right place. So it should just be a case of sliding the motherboard in. A couple of screws to go in, three at the top, three along the middle, and then two towards the bottom to secure the whole board in. It fits pretty well, and there's room by the looks of things for our CPU and any fan cables, which is nice to see. The next port of call is gonna be cooling. And that's where my choice of Thermal Tape's Tough Liquid 360 ARGB sink comes in. It's one of the more budget-oriented coolers. You've got this nice little water block that looks pretty good, but I am gonna be swapping the included fans out for some RGB ones instead. I can link the cooler that comes with the RGB fans in the description below. As I say, I am gonna use this radiator as an intake, so the fans are gonna pull air in from outside the chassis, and the RGB illumination should also help with aesthetics. So it's a bit of a win-win, really. With this case being so open frame, the whole AIO is fairly easy to install. Just gotta screw the rad and the fans, of course, to the integrated fan and radiator mount on the right-hand side of the case, and then add the water block and a bit of thermal paste on top of our 7800X3D CPU. I'm gonna deal with all the cables and wiring a little bit later on. The next part is the graphics card, and I'm very, very excited about this bit. Now, you can see here where the unique design and form factor of this case actually begins to make a lot of sense. So with a spot of look, it should just be a case of angling the graphics card in. Just be really careful when you do this. There we are. And I've just realized I've not removed the PCI lane. So I'm going to take those out up here first, then slide the GPU in. And of course, that airflow through the side panel should be top notch. I ended up lying the case down flat as that proved to be the easier way of actually installing the GPU. And I have to say that looks really, really good. Now, of course, power supply is still remaining. And to be honest with you, any ATX3 80 plus gold certified unit with that Gen 5 power connector will be totally fine. This is the Tough Power 850. As I say, gonna do absolutely perfectly for the build today. And the fully modular cables mean we only plug in the ones we actually need to. The inclusion of the Gen 5 cables also mega useful as it's gonna really help us refine the cable management to the graphics card. With this being a fully modular unit, only gotta plug in the cables that we actually need to. This video is not intended to be a full cables and wiring guide, but we have got one of those on the channel, which you can go and check out if you wish. You also get a removable PSU bracket at the rear of the case, which is gonna make installing the power supply that little bit easier and is a nice touch to see. Take this out, screw the PSU in, and then obviously connect all your cables up with the motherboard, CPU, and GPU cables all running to their respective places.
pieces. And with that, all that remains is to put all the panels back on. So I'm going to do that first before turning this thing on to see exactly how it looks and of course how our 4080 Super performs and whether you should buy one in the gaming benchmarks. <laughs> of call for our testing was Starfield. Here we tested at 1440p high settings and the RTX 4080 Super delivered 110 FPS on average. A very impressive playable frame rate at 1440p but hardly a huge improvement over the original RTX 4080, a card which delivered 108 FPS on average. This is a pattern that very much continues throughout much of our testing and our Apex Legends result at 1440p high was not much different. The 4080 Super on its own individually proved impressive with 200 171 FPS, beating out everything by the 4090 and AMD's 7900 XTX. But once again, the improvement on the original 4080 of just 11 FPS represents a tiny improvement as far as frame rate goes. Hogwarts Legacy at 1440p high was once again a similar tale. 5 FPS increased this time over the original 4080 at 131 versus 126. Cyberpunk 2077 at 1440p high performed really well actually on the 4080 Super. Here with our ray tracing and DLS disabled, we sat at 141, level with the 7900 XTX, though turn RT on and set it to high, DLSS 3, and you can see Nvidia's advantage in this realm certainly start to show. I mean, just look at all those really high-end AMD cards at the very bottom of the graph. Fortnite was a similar story, good performance, but nothing that's going to set the world on fire versus the previous card. 320 FPS on average, an improvement over 305 on the original 4080. Actually, one of the more pronounced improvements we've seen, but still not thin, exactly world beating. Now to be clear, that isn't necessarily a problem. This is a card that intends to deliver far better value for money and a small improvement on performance. It's not like similar performance to the 4080 is exactly disappointing or unexpected. In Warzone at 1440p high with DLSS and FSR enabled and set to quality on their respective AMD and Nvidia GPUs, the 4080 Super once again beats out the rest of the field, barring the 7900 XTX and the 4090. 188 FPS on average represents presented a 5% improvement, if that, over the original 4080. Modern Warfare 2 at 1440p high settings and the 4080 Super topped our charts, beating out the original 4080 by 3, the 7900 XTX by 11, and everything else by a pretty considerable margin. And to give you some numbers for some sim racing games, Formula 1 2022 at 1440p ultra high and the 4080 Super again performed well with a 5 FPS incremental improvement over the original RTX 4080. Where you'll start to see improvements are on our cost per frame graphs. Here you can see the RTX 4080 Super delivers far better value than the original 4080, mainly due to its $200 reduction in MSRP. To round things off, we also tested Alan Wake 2. Forgive us, our data set is still a little bit small here and we're working to get it bigger and bigger as we spend a bit more time with the game. The 4080 Super though, delivering again improvements over the original RTX 4080, but here by individual or fraction frames per second, rather than 5-10% improvements. The 4080 Super then, a really compelling card for the price and that's the bit that really really matters. Yes it could have a little bit more VRAM to compete with something like the 7900 XTX a bit more squarely and yes it is by no means without competition. AMD's aforementioned highest end XTX GPU really does perform well and gives the 4080 some serious pressure but does this card, the super variant, build upon the original design and provide better value for money? It most certainly does and for that I've got to actually commend Nvidia. If you enjoyed this video get subscribed to more from me. Thanks for watching and as always we'll see you in the next one.